so Miss Chair, I am uh, seeing one o'clock on my phone and we are able to go live. So whenever you're ready. Perfect. Okay. Notability is asking me to review it. Right next to the MVP. There we go. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess we'll call the meeting to order at one o'clock. Um, are there any uh, additions to the agenda before we approve the agenda? None from me. None from it. Okay. A motion to approve the agenda? Sure. I'm Paul. Thank you. Um, and minutes from the last uh, meeting all the way back in March. Holy moly. Paul, are you happy with those minutes? I am, yes. Perfect. Thank you. Motion to approve the minute? Yeah, you have it. Thank you. Um, no business arising from the minute. And I guess we just move right into the verbal uh, new business. First one being uh, the land acknowledgement. I'm not sure. Rob, do you want to do you want to take this away or where do we go from here? I think um, it's yours, isn't it, Lisa? It's not administration. That will be yourself uh, as chair. Okay. Um. So I guess uh, back in uh, geez, when did we do our last scrap planning session in Ju July? Um. This was brought to the scrap planning table by myself, uh, wondering if. Uh, the MD would be uh, in favor of doing a land acknowledgement at the beginning of um, certain meetings. Uh, we talked about which meetings it would be, what the land acknowledgement would say, um, and uh, came to the conclusion that it might be best to come to MEC to see if the uh, Municipal Excellence Committee uh, wanted to proceed with this or. Uh, continue to work on it to make any suggestions to council. Um, I did send, and I apologize, it was just sent today. I thought I pressed send a week ago, <laughs> but um, I sent some suggestions or some different um, examples of different land acknowledgements uh, from organizations around our area this morning. I'm not sure if anybody had a chance to go over those, but, um, yeah, I guess that might be a starting point or if I guess we should start with, is this something we want to look into? I have some thoughts on it. Sure. So what you're talking about here is making a change to our procedural bylaw. Um, with um, statements like that. Yeah. Uh, and I think that if you've got some land acknowledgement examples uh, and you were to provide them to the individual councillors, and if individual councillors wanted to do a land acknowledgement at the beginning of a council meeting or any meeting, they absolutely can. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in our procedural bylaw that prohibits it. Right. But putting it in, trying to put it into a procedure bylaw to require it, I don't believe is the right thing. Mm -hmm. I think if councillors feel strongly that there should be a land acknowledgement when the chair of whatever meeting it is asks for approval of the agenda, uh, you know, uh, you can have someone makes a motion to approve the agenda, an individual councillor could make a land acknowledgement statement before the agenda is approved. But I think putting it into um, a procedural bylaw to require it to be done at a council meeting, uh, I don't believe those types of statements belong in the procedural bylaw any more than I think that a requirement for the Lord's Prayer belongs in the procedural bylaw. Yet it does. In some municipalities, it is. Right. I mean, at the beginning of a council meeting, you could make the land acknowledgement. Uh, yourself, Lisa. Mm -hmm. 
like at the begin I don't understand where it would fit into that and like I don't know like would you want it to come from every counselor is that no. what you're suggesting no no then you're requiring council to do something so at the beginning of the agenda the chair agreed mm -hmm. would ask for approval of the agenda and then you could make the motion to approve the agenda and Mr. Chair, I would like to acknowledge that we are on Treaty 7 land and so on and so on. You could very easily okay. do that. Okay. It's just that putting things into procedural bylaw, uh, you know, uh, that some people think are virtuous mm -hmm. uh, is not uh, I don't believe a good use of the procedural bylaw as a guidance tool. Any more mm -hmm. than putting in a requirement for the Lord's Prayer. And, and there are councils that do do that at the beginning of your council meetings. I've been to their council meetings. Mm -hmm. I guess at what point, if you're doing it, if you're doing a land acknowledgement at the beginning of uh, every meeting, um, well, at what point does it just become uh, I guess part of the part of the meeting agenda. It doesn't become a part of the meeting agenda. It's a statement that's made at the beginning of the meeting. Mm -hmm. Right. So then you're putting it on just the onus of the one counselor to to make the acknowledgement um, from their own personal perspective. If a particular counselor believes strongly that there should be a land acknowledgement statement, then that particular counselor should make that statement. But that particular uh, counselor should not require another counselor to make that statement. Okay, so if all five counselors would like to see this a statement be made, you don't think it should be said by five counselors? <laughs> no, I don't think it should be said by five counselors. Okay. It's it's an individual preference and so if an individual has a preference and they would like a state to make a statement or have a statement made there is absolutely nothing prohibiting them from making that statement at the beginning of a council meeting or a committee meeting so like why does it have to be an individual preference why can't it be a preference of the municipality to make the uh acknowledgement now you want to put it in the procedural bylaw. Well, it goes from being an individual statement to a statement on behalf of the municipality. Um, like typically when I hear uh, these land acknowledgements, it's not somebody sitting at the front of the, of the room saying, this is my acknowledgement that they're usually speaking on behalf of the organization or group that uh, they represent. That, actually, that's not correct. Uh, you see a lot of places when there are uh, media events, mm -hmm. uh, an individual elected official will make that statement at the beginning of the media event. They're not speaking on behalf of the government, they're speaking on behalf of themselves. Hmm. I don't know, I guess I haven't, uh, I haven't noticed that, but I was from what I've uh, seen, I was always under the impression it was speaking on behalf of like the city of Calgary or the the Banff, Banff Center or whatever organization it is. But Rob had his hand up here. Yeah, it, Lisa, it does sound like you're moving towards making putting into our a formal uh, agenda item. So that would be a procedural bylaw. Yeah. I want. Yeah, I wonder um, if in fact this should really be a more fulsome discussion at a strat plan meeting rather than the MEC meeting. It is a sensitive topic for some people. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if perhaps it's to have that discussion with the rest of council, if mm -hmm. what, what they would want to do with that. Because lots of municipalities do it, um, some don't. Um, our school board does it, um, they, I love their announcements. Uh, they do it at the beginning of uh, events, they, they make the same announcement. Mm -hmm. so, anyway, I, I just put I just offer that as a suggestion. Mm -hmm. I think that might be a better way to do it, Robert, because uh, right now I'm not going to be in agreement agreement that it be put into the procedural bylaw. 
just because uh, it's a sensitive issue. Uh, it's not really municipal business. Uh, it's something other than that. And uh, I think perhaps a more frank discussion at uh, the next strat planning meeting might be more appropriate. Yeah, I, I'm fine with that. I know I I walked it on at the last strat planning meeting, so there wasn't an opportunity for anybody to uh, think about it um, during that strat planning meeting. So if we want to, uh, I guess, wait to discuss this further at our next strat planning meeting, that would be fine with me. And through the chair, we can we can add the information that you provided and put a short memo together that it was discussed okay. here and to go to to uh, to strap plan so that you've got documentation already for you. So it's just not a walk on. It's already firmly in the agenda. OK, perfect. Thank you. Uh, is there anything else? The, with the land acknowledgement item. Yeah, Rob. Yep, just make a motion that you'd like to, um, that you'll put it onto the, uh, put on administration, yeah. put it onto the agenda. Sure, I'll make that your next draft plan session. I'll make that okay. motion. That it be the uh, discussion on land acknowledgement be referred back to the next draft planning meeting. Yeah. Thank you. All right, moving on to level of service cost review. Paul, this was yours. That was my thing. Yeah, that's uh, that topic has been around for quite a few years. Um, and the municipality has uh, grown and diversified considerably uh, since the last time it was discussed. And uh, you will recall that uh, you know, there's always a discussion or a comment made when uh, something is being done in one particular part of the municipality uh, that why should the taxpayers in another part of the municipality pay for that? And I know that uh, in Red Deer a few years ago, we actually did the cost of services review and so uh, right now we've got a large item pickup uh, and we have now have parks uh, looking after cutting grass and we have more playgrounds uh, and we're going to need more playgrounds. If you were in Exshaw and you went to the sports day, uh, we're going to need a lot of playgrounds. And I think that for the next council, I think it would be really a, uh, a benefit to them if they understood what it cost us to provide services in different parts of the municipality. And how much revenue do we generate in that part of the municipality? Because literally we have the ability to adjust the tax rates in different parts of the municipality. If council sees uh, that it can be justified. Well, you can't justify it if you can't measure it. And so I think it would be probably a good way to start would be to look at uh, the terms of reference for the Red Deer level of service review. Or we could make up our own. Uh, or admin could find uh, level of service reviews from other jurisdictions that might make it really easy because I have no problem plagiarizing with pride. Uh, especially government documents because they already belong to us. And uh, if we can find something to give us a starting point. Uh, I know 2022 is the target date for it. Uh, I know when I was a new councillor and when you were a new councillor, Lisa, the first thing that comes out is where do we get our money from? How much do we get? And what does it cost us to do this? And so when we wanted, uh, I'm going to use Exshaw as an example. Um, you know, we now plow the alleys that we never used to plow before. Uh, we now have doggy pooper bags all over the place. Um, and, you know, we've got people wanting public washrooms. Uh, and so all of these things have cost to them. And it would be nice to understand if that cost could be justified in that part of the MD of Bighorn, or do we need to put some sort of a 
an increase, a minor increase on their mill rate to cover those costs. And so in order to help a future council understand that question, uh, I think we need to get started because if we brought back to the next MEC meeting, a draft terms of reference, and then we worked it there, uh, and then we would get it to the October council meeting where the can will get kicked down the road to the new council. But at least we're starting on it because we understand the question. If we had a whole bunch of brand new counselors, uh, by the done by the time they're done learning to drink from a fire hose, uh, you know, a year later they start working on things that they believe is important. So I think we could just get started on some of the work for them to make it a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Rob, I know this uh, level of service cost review was part of the budget. Uh, was it was part of the 2022 though, like Paul said, or? That's correct. It was put into the three-year budget and it is an item in 2022. Yes. Okay. So it wouldn't be completely unrealistic if we started uh, working on the RSP uh, so that, I don't know, even January 2022. Uh, it can be uh, like the project could possibly be awarded. Well, right now, it's up. To, it will really be up to a new council where they want to proceed. What Paul has mentioned is to do some groundwork, so a council going into seeing this item would know that there has been some work previously done, and they'll have mm -hmm. more of an idea of what what that particular item means. Level of service. Mm -hmm. uh, you could start to do that. Um, really, but though a new council is the one who has to approve the budget. The budget's already set, um, but but they can also change the budget if they want to. Mm -hmm. Depends what, how much. For right now, um, well, we can certainly look at uh, what Red Deer's is. I'd have to have a look at it because, frankly, I have not had got delved into this at all. So you don't have a lot of time uh, with your next MEC meetings to get something in front of council. So I, yeah, I don't, Rob, I wasn't thinking that we would get it in front of council. Okay. What I was thinking is that, uh, so Shana has already done some of the work on this. Uh, she may actually know better who has done more work, like what municipalities have actually done it. Um, and then, so, you know, it comes back to us on the next agenda. We look at it and we go, okay, so these are the different things that were done. Uh, and then what do we want to do? And then if we actually manage to get a draft terms of reference done by October before the municipal election, then it would be something that could go, well, it would go to the new council anyway, because I don't see us getting this approved by our council uh, in this term, because we just don't have any done any work on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Think of secession planning. What we're doing is we're taking all of the loose ends that are out there and we're tidying them up. We're cutting them all to the same length uh, and positioning them so that uh, a new council, when they sit on their first MEC committee meeting and they read the minutes and they go, what's a level of service review? And then uh, they get to look at the work that was done and they go, oh, that's what that means. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it just helps them be able to do their job in the future rather than spend the next year learning about everything. Uh, and then, you know, it happens two years later because when you have major changes in council, the first year is a learning curve. Uh, and it's a steep learning curve. Lisa, I don't have to tell you. And there's a lot of things you got to learn about, a lot of things you got to read. Uh, mm -hmm. And so the more work that the committees can do for future committees, I think uh, it's really just succession planning. Mm -hmm. okay. Paul, is this the right venue for doing that work? I just, I'm asking that question because it just looks like we haven't, council hasn't made a decision on this. I agree that some background is going to be required for a new, uh, for a new council and councillors to understand when they see all those projects brought forward for the new budget, they're going to wonder what the heck is this thing? Yes, and so we know what it is. Uh, and so by getting the groundwork done on it, uh, to get it to a position where council will actually have a terms of reference to consider going forward into 2022, we can help get that prepared for them. 
Uh, I don't see us doing anything with it other than looking at it. Is this uh, what should be done? Uh, how would this be done? Uh, municipal excellence, understanding your cost of services is an excellent thing for municipal councillors to have. Um, so I think it's the right venue to do the groundwork on. We're the same ones that did the customer satisfaction survey. Uh, but it's council that makes the decisions. All we do is do some work for it. And I think understanding what it costs us for our parks and what it costs us uh, for our playgrounds and plowing the trails and things like that. I think that's all an excellent thing uh, for municipal councils to understand. And I think we can get it started for them and the next council can decide whether or not they want to put it in the shredder uh, because we won't be approving a terms of reference. It'll be the next council. Mm -hmm. So I understand putting the cost of the services together, but you had a revenue component too, though. Absolutely. So does that mean then we go by revenue generated by ward? Obviously taxation, residential, non-residential, to say this is what needs to, this is what a, a particular ward needs to pay for it if it wants particular services or service plus plus. Here, here would be the question. Does the ward generate enough revenue to cover the cost of the services it's provided? I, I think that's a very practical question because that's um, a way that people ask me, um, best way to say this like what their taxes are going towards uh like of course there's all the the big stuff but then they do wonder uh like they i know in some of uh the hamlets in war two they see that they've got there's a lot of tax money going into the md from their hamlet for the services that they're getting well that's their perspective um, so I think it's a actually a good question. It's a question that comes from the mouths of our uh, our residents as well. I've been actually hearing it recently. Mm -hmm. What's your tax money go for? So, uh, you know, I've been around for a while and administration has always resisted doing this. Um, and I think it's time uh, because the demographic in our municipality has changed uh, and our services have changed and their demand for services have increased. So why would you not want to know the cost of providing those services? Mm -hmm. I didn't say I didn't. <laughs> okay, so can we... Uh, do some research and look at the different types of cost of services studies that have been done and bring it back to the next MEC meeting. Yep, I'll ask Jane to put something together for you. Yeah, and then all I'm trying to do uh, is make sure that we're not leaving things out there dangling um, because I expect we are going to have some changes on council. And it'd be really nice if uh, we had some groundwork done for them so they'd actually understand the questions that they're being asked. So from a procedural perspective uh, through the chair, if this work gets done at your next MEC meeting, how does that go anywhere near the council? Does it just sit on the books with MEC until a new committee is struck? And it yeah. just sits yeah. there for a new a new agenda to come well, out? It'll come back to us and we can look at the different ones. And then the next question I have is, okay, how, how would we proceed? And then get that to the next MEC meeting. And then it would have to go to council because MEC doesn't make decisions. We're just, we're strictly advisory. So do we have two more, two MEC meetings? I'm not sure if we'll have. Yes. Yeah, we do. Okay. So September, in October, or yep. yeah, I think we have so, another? Don't we? Actually, sorry, we have another? Uh, September twentieth is our next uh, meeting, and then October is actually our MEC meeting falls on election day. So, uh, 
you could have your MEC meeting on election day. Uh, let's just bring it back. Why not, right? Um, everything is falling on the next election day. Uh, <laughs> I saw something on the federal government too that's happening on election day. Um, yeah, well, I mean, let's bring it back to the next MEC meeting and then see what we can do with it, if anything. We'll bring you information back. Yeah, that'd I be good. I think that's a good idea, yeah. Thanks, Paul. Do you have anything else to add to the level of service cost review? No, but now you want large item pickup. How are you going to pay for that? Do you guys generate enough taxes to pay for that? <laughs> I don't know. You get to know. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I added this to the uh, list of business to discuss today, and it's been something that keeps coming up in uh, all the different uh, community association meetings that I attend on a regular basis, um, and it's come up at community services board before. Um, but uh, and then I also got an email further to a discussion in community services board from uh, a resident in ward four also. Uh, talking about how this would be a significant benefit to uh, the residents in Ward 4 as well. Um, so I guess I just wanted to open the discussion of uh, looking into uh, providing a service like this, um, maybe once or, or twice a year. I know um, from the discussion that was had around the table uh, at the Community Services Board, uh, something that uh, the the members of the committee that were from uh, EXHA haven't seen a need for it, but the members of the committee from everywhere else in the MD did see a need for it. Um, and I, I don't know if it's a proximity to the to the landfill or um, or what the cause is, but that was something that was just I found of interest around that table. Um, yeah, and I guess I just wanted to add it to the agenda as uh, as an item to look look into. So how would that proceed? Would it be like Public Works would come back with um, a report on uh, the logistics of having a large item pickup and then a cost associated with the large item pickup? I think so, and maybe like how it would work. I don't know if they would uh, like a large items would need to be dropped off at. Uh, That's the logistics part. Yeah, the logistics part. But um, I know there's a resident in Lactozarks that has volunteered to do this twice a year, and he's gotten a significant uh, uh, amount of uptake on it, and uh, the landfill has has agreed to accept. The waste coming in from him and the community uh, at no charge because they see it as a community service uh, to the residents of Lactus Um Yeah, so I'm not sure uh, what the cost would be or what the logistics would be, like Paul said, but uh, it would definitely be something I'd like to look into and just be able to get back to people on because I get asked this question quite a bit and I thought. Uh, municipal excellence might be a better place for it to be uh, brought up. So just in terms of cost associated, so a fridge mm -hmm. costs 20 bucks to get the Freon taken out of it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, and then the logistics part is, uh, you got to do a lot of driving out in the country uh, to pick up a large item. And then, of course, what is that large item? Is it a freezer or a fridge or is it a combine? And well, I guess we're you know, this. Uh, Got to have some details. Yeah, I think where this uh, where this started was uh, with complaints about garbage uh, sitting beside the garbage bins that are not suitable for the MD garbage bin. So something like a used camping chair or a broken hockey stick. They're not allowed to go into the MD garbage bin. But then uh, for somebody to drive to the Francis Cook landfill to dispose of a broken camping chair seems a little uh, counterintuitive. So if there were, 
like, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure there could be some standards of what can and can't be uh, added to the list of a large item pickup, but uh, I, I'm not thinking like fridges and uh, uh, I don't know, fridges and dishwashers or couches, like that type of stuff, more uh, the prohibited stuff that isn't allowed to go into uh, a community garbage uh, a community garbage bin. So one of the things that uh, Banff and Canmore do is that they actually have a, a class three bin in their municipal yard. Mm -hmm. And then people bring stuff and put it in that. Uh, concept being that why do you need to have uh, 500 pickup trucks driving back and forth to the Francis Cook landfill when they can just drive down to the municipal yard? Mm -hmm. uh, and when the bin fills up, they take it uh, to the Club Francis Cook landfill, and then the municipalities get a discounted rate uh, when they bring stuff in there. So that I means that's one possible option for it. Uh, that's a good option. I would, uh, my sense is to get this to wiggle forward would be to first ask uh, Big Al. How could it work? Could it, or could it even work? Mm -hmm. And if it could work, how would it work? Right. And what are the costs involved in it? Because it's not an insignificant cost. If you just think of the scrub and brush cleanup, uh, what that costs us, the horsepower we have to put into it and the vehicles. Um, you know, in Canmore, what they do, uh, I think what they do, yes, it is what they do is that if you've got a fridge or a couch or a stove uh, or a dishwasher, you can phone up the municipality and the municipality goes and picks it up so it's not sitting in the alleyways uh, and next to the dumpsters that make the place look like a ghetto. Uh, mm -hmm. Because at the end of every month when you drive around the dumpsters in Canmore, you know, there's a couple of households dumped there because people are moving out and they've got nowhere to bring anything. Mm -hmm. And right. the landlord is going to keep the damage deposit. So they hump it down by the bin and they drop it off. So mm -hmm. and that's pretty much what goes on. So I know Al is aware of that. He mm -hmm. may have some suggestions. You know, the spot pickup thing. If the other municipalities went to the spot pickup thing, you've got to know that it's probably the most economical way of doing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it doesn't seem like it when you uh, think about it like that, but I guess uh, versus having somebody, uh, I don't know, going through going through the bins, pulling it out, the time that it takes to do that, and then uh, driving away from it, then having somebody else to drive back and pick it up. Uh, and that's just the stuff that is put in those bins either by accident or on purpose, but... Rob? Yeah, why can't residents just take it to the dump? I do that all the time if I've got stuff coming out of the house. If I'm doing home rentals or the dishwasher goes kaput on me, I just go and pack it up into the van and they take it down and dump it off. So I'm a little bit, I'm, I can see you wanting to have a service, but I also think there's some part of it where people have to have an independence and look after themselves. People throwing stuff that shouldn't be in there to me are being lazy. And yeah, you're right, Paul. You see it around Canmore all the time. Peaks of grassy, come the end of the month, you might as well be going to pick up a couch if you need one because everything is all over the place. It's a mess. Yeah. And then they get mattresses. All yeah. Number of mattresses and, you know. But I, then, but I do that myself, though. I mean, yeah. I take it upon That's myself not to try to dump stuff that I don't need. And I just take it down and take it to the dump. If this is something that people or elderly people can't get a truck or they can't move it, I, I don't know. So, what are you actually hearing from your from your from your people in Ward Two? Is it really that, or just want a service they can just dump it and then we just pick it up? I'm trying to uh, understand. Well, I think it's more just the the stuff that gets left or taken out and left by the MD employee by the bin. Um, and like, I guess for somebody to make a trip to the landfill to dispose of like one camping chair was the example. Uh, that seems a little uh, counterintuitive to have to drive something like that to the landfill. Like I, 
understand everybody could be uh, making their own pile um, of stuff <laughs> and eventually go do a trip. But uh, that was just one example. I guess there was another example, uh, a couple examples in Lactis Arcs where it's harder for the elderly residents to uh, get to the dump and to uh, have uh, the ability to load something bigger into their into their vehicle and move it. So um, I guess it's kind of it's a it's a combo. I'm hearing it from a number of different people, and also as a way to as a suggestion to try and keep the community and the the garbage can area cleaner. Um, so that's that's where I'm hearing it from. So there's a, you know there's a couple of things, um, and, and Rob uh, jumped on a couple of good points there, uh, and then of course with the seniors and bigger items and things, there's actually a service already exists to deal with that. It's called Junk to the Dump, uh, and you phone them up, and they come over and they take your stuff. Um, so, I mean, it's not as if there is no way to do it. It's the question of who's paying for it. Uh, and then you've got things like mattresses. So when our staff at the Francis Cook Landfill, when they handle mattresses, honest mm -hmm. to God, they have on a hazmat suit. Because you wouldn't believe what we actually found on those mattresses when we did an off health and safety dive into it. Because we get a lot of mattresses because of the hotel industry. Uh, and the biologicals on mattresses uh, create a biohazard for our staff. So, you know, there's no simple answer to this. Um, a lot of people want somebody else to do it for them. Uh, I don't have the number for junk to the dump at my fingertips, but uh, it's easy to get. Uh, so the service exists. The question is who's paying for it? Right. And I don't know about a lawn chair and a hockey stick. Um, and our guys haul it out of the bin because it's already sticking out of the bin. Because I don't think our public works guys dive into the bin. They uh, do. They actually do. Our public works guys get into the bin. I don't know. If, Have how, you ever seen that? If there is an item that. Uh, has the potential and if it's caught that has the potential to um wreck the the truck um and its capabilities um they they do they'll pull it out and put it to the side and then somebody will come around with that um just with a pickup truck and um, go get it yeah. and go get that stuff but our guys cannot actually go in those bins that's a confined workspace well i don't know if they go physically go in them but somehow larger items that aren't supposed to be in there are getting taken out and put on the side. So I'm leaning towards the video camera on the bin or the game camera on the bin. And then when we've got to deal with it, we just send the bill to whoever put it in there. Well, and, and that's part we've of done, where we've this done comes that. from too, because Lactis Arcs has the community association has taken it upon themselves to have a video camera that they monitor themselves. Actually, it's a still camera, but that takes pictures. Oh, I thought it was a video camera. And now oh. Harvey Heights is looking into doing the same type of thing. Um, just because uh, as a community, they don't appreciate these larger items and uh, things being left by the bin. But I don't know if that necessarily provides a solution. So. No, because in, in Akshaw, uh, what we get here is people that head to the landfill but the landfill's already closed mm -hmm. and the first bin they find gets filled up and it's usually construction waste uh and you know i mean i've got a couple of people doing it i gave them a complimentary picture of their license plate uh and then sent it to uh al okay. and, and then he dealt with it so, but I mean, you know, I don't think we should be going into the closed circuit TV business like they did in England. Um, no. But, you know, human nature being what it is, um, people are hard to train too. Yeah. I, 
I think the best way uh, to have a better understanding of this would maybe ask administration to bring back a memo from Public Works on the logistics of having a large item pickup and the possibilities and the challenges. Mm -hmm. I mean, anything can be done if you throw enough money at it. The question is, yeah. whose money do you want to throw at it? Right. Yeah. Well, I think it, yeah, just a good, uh, I've had enough people contact me and ask me specifically about this. So for me to have some more information to bring back to them where like, yeah, that could be a possibility, but it would cost this much amount of money or uh, this is not a possibility at this time right now. What, whatever the, the conclusions might be. <laughs> Um, and here's some potential solutions that we could uh, we could suggest. But um, yeah, I, I don't think this is going away. I think some in some areas things have gotten a little bit better, and in some areas it seems as though that things have gotten a little bit worse over the last nearly four years of my term that people have been sharing with me. So um, yeah. Well, I think one thing also to keep in mind too is I don't think you'll, I don't think you can ever really get away from the broken camping chair. People are still going to have that. I don't think they consider that a large item. They just don't understand that it could wreck our 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 vehicle. Yeah. You know, so I think there's a kind of a gray wavy line that says, you know. Of course, you don't want to make a run to the dump with your one broken camping chair, but it sure could be helpful to utilize a service that um, can bring it to the dump for you. But those are those big household items, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Still a bit of a balance there. Right. Well, I think through the chair, I think you have a couple of options here. You could take this particular item and put it onto a strap plan session. You could ask the question of administration at a council meeting. You could make uh, a motion uh, through this committee and then bring it to council and then see if you can get council to give some direction to admin. But I'm not seeing um, what your timeline is for this of how quickly you want to turn around on this. Because what I've just uh, said to you will take time if it goes yeah. through a process. I don't know if there uh, needs to be a, a super quick timeline. It's something that I've been talking about for for quite a while now. Um, so I think if uh, if it is something that MAC wants to take on, even just to start the conversation and gather the information, and then from there, it could go to a strap planning session. But I don't think it's something that's just going to go away, unfortunately. So um, I'm not sure I'm looking for some guidance on how to proceed with something, getting the information to answer a question like this from you guys. So how, how about this? How about if um, Public Works came back to this committee with a briefing on large item pickup logistics uh, challenges and then this committee could look at that and say okay where does this go does this go right to council or does this go to strategic planning and also if i can just throw in another um, bit of an idea too is maybe large item pickups happen annually or biannually maybe that's yeah. you know something yeah. that looks that way where it's not like once a week or once a month it's just a couple of times a year that we're able to do that but that still means that people need to store those sorts of things um, as well right so just mm -hmm. an idea to put out there mm -hmm. well it's back to what Barbara said sometimes people need to take responsibility for their own problems um, you know uh, picking up the phone and phoning the MD to get someone to pick up a fridge or a stove uh, has a cost into it uh, and it's easy to figure out what that cost is how much does it cost to send a truck and two employees down to civil flats to pick up a stove mm -hmm. so 
or 18 stoves and all of a sudden do you have the vehicle that can handle that as well yeah and the other right. thing that we're seeing is um at the uh, transfer site up in benchlands on highway 40 is uh quite a few people that are, don't live in the MD of bighorn use that because yeah. according to the number of fridges and stoves that they get in there there has to be a hundred thousand people living up there <laughs> or everybody buys a used one every three months i don't know <laughs> but uh you know whatever service we provide will be abused it's just is it one a service that we should provide right mm -hmm. i mean it's it it'll cost you a lot less to have jump to the dump pick up a fridge and a stove then it would be for us to send two municipal employees to go pick it up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how how much of this do we want to take on is the real question. And yeah. is it something that we should even take on? Because, you know, and remember this too, is that um, everybody wants everything until they figure out they got to pay for it. And then not so much. Um, you know, everybody wants Rome Transit, uh, but if it's going to cost you an extra thousand dollars a year in your household taxes, it's a, people take a step back and go, "Well, I don't want to pay that much." So, right. so maybe uh, minor information from Public Works, and then decide if it gets shuffled to Council uh, for strategic planning, um, or if we just leave it alone. Just because people well, want something doesn't mean we have to provide it to them. No, I I agree with that, but I think it it does mean we should uh, listen to what they're looking for and give them a a more definitive answer. We'll be able to give them an answer. Yeah. Because right now, the only answer you have is I don't know why we don't do that. Right. And there's there's a cost associated to it. Well, what's the cost? I'm not sure. I don't know. And counselors can't stand saying, I don't know. Because we're <laughs> supposed to know everything. <laughs> I'm sure that I swear, that there's people that, I swear there's people that stay up all night long trying to think of questions that I can't answer. <laughs> of course, it is that time of the year, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, what'd you like to do with this? Can you get Al to just write something up, a one pager? Yeah, just leave it with admin. Yeah, we'll bring it back to your next meeting. Yeah, because I know he's bounced, he's he's fought with this before, um, so it won't be new to him. Yeah, he might already have a lot of this information. But... Yeah, I'm just worried about the timing right now, just only because these guys are trying to finish off all their summer projects. Oh right. yeah, yeah yeah yeah, and then. You know, in November, you've got budget. So mm -hmm. why don't we just leave it with admin and ask admin to bring it back to MEC with a briefing from Public Works? How's that? Okay, done. And not put a timeline on it. How's that? Yeah. But now that doesn't mean you got four years to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, do you need anything else from us there, Rob, or a motion for that? Or No, I got it written down here. It's captured in the minutes. Uh, admin will do that. So you don't need to have this by your next meeting then, but as long as it gets done. I I think so. Like, yeah, I don't, okay. I don't know if we should put a timeline on it, like, within the next, like, six months type of thing, but I... Like if it's something that could uh, be captured in the next capital budget, if it's uh, realistic, then it's an operating uh, cost. Actually, it's not capital; it's operating. Sorry, operating budget. But um, yeah, it's just uh, yeah. I think it would just be good to have some answers. Okay. Information. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get that. No problem. Okay. 
Good. All right. Um, is there anything else on your business? Nothing else is on the agenda. So next um, meeting is scheduled. Yeah, Monday, September 20th at 9 a.m. Does that work for everybody? I will not be able to be in attendance in that that morning. Um, if you guys wanted to move it afterwards, that is uh, nomination day. So I have to be available until at least noon <clears throat> for that day. Would right. it work to move it to one o'clock or? What time does nomination close? Noon, isn't it, uh, Leslie? Close at noon, yeah. So one o'clock work for you? I hope so. I think I think you have 45 sets of nomination papers to process, don't you, from what I'm hearing? I may. <laughs> <laughs> OK, um, so is that agreeable to everybody, though, 1 o'clock on the 20th? Or is there some hesitation, Leslie, or is there I a, will a different? All I can say is that I will endeavor to be there if we have a 1 o'clock meeting. Okay. That, that would be better for me, but I also okay. don't know where my day will take me that day as well. Okay. Fair enough. Well, yeah, and we're only, I mean, we're averaging an hour or so for these meetings. Mm -hmm. September the 20th is a Monday. Okay. Would it be better to have it on the 21st, Leslie, just in case you don't know what's going to happen with this nomination? I have community services board that day at 9 a.m. Yeah, okay. Let's stick to the one o'clock. Um, we'll try and make that. I'll try and make that work. Okay. 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 Or 20th, one o'clock. Robert, what was the date that we had for uh, streets and roads for the next meeting? I'll tell you right now. That will take place on September 27th it's at 9 a.m. It's the 27th. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. All right. So uh, next meeting scheduled for Monday, September 20th at 1 p.m. Yep. yep. That's what I got. All right, motion to adjourn. There you go, you can adjourn. Thanks, Paul. We did it. Okay, everybody. Woohoo. <laughs> Back Thanks, to the Paul. emails. I'll see you yeah. tomorrow.